We are given the perfect excuses. We know our choices well in advance. We are even the shapers of our own deaths. Whatever our sufferings, they are self-inflicted. Even the inexplicable ones require only time for solution. Time for doubt to die. For the writer of fiction, whose life seems to be moving forward inexorably, like a boat heading for a waterfall, there are only two sides, the speaker and the narrator, sometimes the same, others not, and these are as past and future, or even as water and air. For the writer of fact, there is no limit set to the number of sides from which an event may be examined, nor temporal limits. The only constraint is placed on his own voice, for only in displacement of effect can one retain objectivity, or, just as appropriately, on his own identity, for he can have none. Only in obliteration of his center can he attain to all points simultaneously on the sphere of reality's influence upon itself from the inside out. These two are all that there are in the living realm of the active, the one like the pen, the vessel, the other the writer, the messenger, and the both are as one writing itself. They overlap one another constantly, interfering and vying for an imagined impact upon the ultimate conclusion. The pen will run out of ink, and the writer become his own center given time. The same is true between beings. Should they seem to cross paths, they are truly one. Should they seem to seek to establish relationships, it is only the energy of time. They are writing each other, and this is always true. They will write of limitless variations on their own true path imagining opportunities arising alongside it, branches cascading away from it, sharing it with other travelers, even its own end, and yet none of these are as real. Williams tells this to both the boy and myself. The crackle of the radio voice box of the breather interferes only slightly. The hot, dry winds of limbo, touching playfully at his trailing turban. He is pulled on a long black trench above his gray flannel suit to keep off the industrialized pollutants. The boy's front piece remains bloodied. The pen, this plane, provides us always with the proper raw materials for telling our story. If there is dissatisfaction with what we have at hand, it is due to its lack of necessity. Stories of fact are those true to ourselves, and those of fiction those true to commodity. All writing is true, though just as it would on a single page of paper, so in reality it will inevitably overlap regardless, or ironically or not, because of this. The ship is on autopilot. The holographic generator projects an image of a remote outcropping of shale in an otherwise vast, flat stretch of desolation, slowly rotating. When two of these writings overlap, they may appear similar. They may reflect one another, or even contain one another, yet no two stories can have the same ending. This is the last truth of writing. It is the wall to which all writers are inevitably led. The bending sheet of parchment we call the mind, sky, floating in the wind. The opening doorway to the next dimension. I can understand, 
as the information I gathered on him before coming to the terminus indicated how he could have easily been one of the settlers of Limbo and founders of its philosophies. If you are on a path, he waves his hand in the air, sweeping upward from his shoulder. It is yours. You can no more share it than you can share your body. But it is, as is your mind related to your brain, always greater than your body. They you saw at the terminus were, if anything, no more than politely embarrassed for expecting their path to follow their bodily gestures, their speaking, their expressed expectations, as their mind seems to react to the alchemy of inebriation, the chemical gravitation of desire, or the natural and beauteous defense mechanisms of intoxication. These are all writing, in terms of fact, technique, and style outgrowing the ego, or, in terms of fiction, the present tension arising from either the past writing the future, or the future the past. Here there are truths within truths. Here we may see that writing is fractal. Here we may see that writing is older than verbal communication. Here we may see that writing is the implosion of the nothingness called reality. Williams stops for a moment to survey the rotating holographic map. We're almost there. He turns halfway towards us and says, The boy speaks. Wilhelm, why are we going here? What is it that we're looking for? Piscotter looks to me and I glance down at the floorboards. There are things that are unseen by youth, even ignored by man, that are left to be the burden of the weariest, as am I. The difficulty in writing is its ease. It does not require writers, any more than writers require pens. Writers would still be writers even without pens. Writing would still go on even if writers had no heads, etc., Writing is the eternal that promises writers immortality. And yet, here is the greatest wound of all the writers. It is not unlike the joke, I stand by my words, yet my words stand alone. Where did I go? In being aware of this need for egolessness in writing, one has uncovered the greatest paradox of writing. The self is not needed, yet without it, Writing cannot occur. How can one write if one has no self? This would seem to mean that the dead too write, or perhaps write through us when we read, only thinking this writing. So if, as one must in courage of others, one chooses to step off from their path, they will see it going on without them. Is this anything other than death? as it is in reality, seemingly arbitrary, inexplicable to loved ones, without consolation besides the practice of ritual. How hard it would be to explain to others the absolute rightness of one's own foreseen death. Mourners almost always assume the deceased has come to their conclusion too soon, when perhaps they only seek to see a mirror of their own egos where no longer there is one. In fact, there is no wrong time to realize this fact, that to stray from one's path is to strengthen it, for in every way the path itself will remain. One's writings will come to the light of many an eye, and in the meantime, one has enlightened themselves as to the nature of mind. All writing is at war with itself, as is the body, or similarly, the environment, or so it appears to us, from within these organismic systems, when really they are only automatically recycling. This active process of continual adaptative modification of system within system is survival, 
and it differs from death, which is passive, only in frequency. For once one has died, has, that is, seen their own path from outside, one knows there is no true path, though there may be more traveled roads, and that all paths wither eventually, that there is truly no inside or outside, except to space-time, the continuum, the sky, because it opens and, like a good story, has two sides. What is necessary for survival to occur passively is to see all paths, all moments in time, simultaneously superimposed, and this is death in activity. This event is the origin of voice, and after a manner of speaking, it is this we are going to find. Wilhelms concludes by coughing into his respirator until his goggles fog up and he is nearly doubled over. The young one and I lean in to help him, but there is really nothing either of us know to do but hold our hands over his convulsing ribcage, which obviously doesn't do any good. We look at each other grimly, each consumed in our own false conclusions, mine having hoped to find a more concrete link to the general, the boy's being, if I know him from his actions, to kill me for training. Eventually, the old man regains himself. I'm all right, I'm all right. Quit your fuss and acting like a couple of old queens about Potemkin. He shoes us away and hunches over the control console. Still a ways away, I say, says making his way out of, to the stem, where he sits in lotus position and falls immediately into a trance. Again, I am left behind with the child whose angled glances dry my throat. He begins reviewing the ship's onboard uplink to the information network, scanning with unnerving rapidity through news broadcasts on the holographer. I lean back in the crook of the stern, unfolding my ocular scanner from the brim of my hat, and using the retinal motion interface, look over what information I can find on Piscotter Wilhelm's in the global legal data library on the thin lens of transparent plex. I copy Smythe's disk. After some time, the ship slows, its engines sputtering, sending loud vibrations throughout. Piscotter hops nimbly over the holographic console, through its display field, landing beside his friend, who obediently deactivates the device. William seems refreshed from his meditations, and looks from the lad to myself with dogged eagerness, as though debating which one of us to share some personal good news with first. By way of introduction, he advises both of us thus, one person in an advanced state of enlightenment may help out another who is not. When they next meet, perhaps their situations will be reversed, and the more enlightened get to play the younger, more foolish party then. He looks at me. The one who is following you will kill me. There is no harm in telling you this. You don't need to feel any tension in your throat. He turns to the boy, and I am going to kill you. You don't need to be afraid. You understand your spirit is of neither particle nor wave. Your youth will die, as will my age. These are the mysteries of this page. The young man does not so much as blink out of turn, replying, I abide, master, until I am released. Williams is as exuberant as a child himself, although merely pleasantly glowing. We exit the ship by the retractable staircase from the lower deck on the port side, 
beside the holes. Every moment in time is a self-contained fractal, its own impossible loop. The sky is flat, yet never twice the same, like a living graph, evolving in an ever-changing game. We live in the hollow spaces of these moments, as do thoughts within our brains. In this way, writing is nothing but shadows, the impulses of bats that echo in caves. And following this reasoning, each writer cobbles up his own coffin from other crabs selling seashells by the shores of the sea. We are climbing a gradual slope of slippery shale, Fisher Bill's voice crackling melodically in our headsets, the wind cascading our garments and fecundating us in scathing waves of stagnant sand. Occasionally he turns around to monitor our progress, I bringing up the rear and party to the child's morosity, lightened by the elder's glances, as well as the greater barrage of updrafts, my body acting to shield them from these, upsetting my footing. The body aches, it disobeys, the winds insist. It is not us that the writing is, for we live next to it, nor is the written message the same as the act of writing itself, for as many methods and techniques as there are, the desire to catalog these rather than merely utilize them is used up like youth by age to shield the real issue, which is continual decay. There is no permanent method. There is no trans-temporal technique. All writing manifests itself as symptoms and treatment, while the disease and the cure that cause it remain just beyond the realm of its expressions. Here is the solution contained within the question. The conclusion of a thing was its purpose, and this motivation is its cause. In plain text, the cure of anything is its cause, inverted from unconsciousness to consciousness. Everything else is a sideshow along the way. Roses to be sniffed, dying, poisoned, radioactive roses. Gather them while they may. These last few words seem to be rattling even Wilhelms himself, and he stops for a moment to rest. He mumbles a few words to himself, swaying, then calls the boy close to him. It's time, he tells him. Give me your sword. I send you to the light. The young one's head is cleanly severed. It rolls down the slope we just climbed. A chill runs through me. Piscotter looks up. It was only one of many, a blank, still training. His body, which had been knelt before Bill, now crumples. It seems his voice is still in the air. We'll cook him and eat him now. It's blanking ritual. Without it, his voice will linger, echoing as I described, bearing a message meant for only our ears and already heard. He disrobes him ravenously and flashes out a small taser, frying up some of the shale to white heat and supporting the carcass above it with a gravity crunch palm unit. The blanks are proud, Bill whispers, speaking loudly enough for the wind caring little if I am listening. Some say too proud. They are lying, only lying dead now, only lying dead. He kicks the corpse on one side to start it spinning in its stasis field, the flesh heating rapidly and flaking off in peeling cinders. His name was T.R. Elliot. T.R. was his encryption modus, 
Each one's got one of their own. His stood for tabula rasa, blank slate. The translation is the branch name for his entire peer group, everybody who came up with him. Through true bullshit, he could over-easy anything required, including the tricks you saw him pull. Although, as I say, he was still learning. So he wasn't really a hologrammer then? I cannot resist asking. Yes and no. Bugs depend on a graft, bud, implant-based system. Whereas the blanks learn the manifestation method and, in doing so, formulate their own widget. The bugs have a hierarchy beyond the capacity for comprehension of most other than those cleared for the highest levels, and the majority of them operate in the dark beyond what little light they can surround themselves in with their hollow mods. The blanks are divided exclusively into dyads, a master and a pupil, although through the communications of the masters they are progressed in ordered collections and will all bear resemblances to one another, despite the fact that the blanks themselves do not even know others like them exist. The bug masters have access to all levels of the bug hierarchy, awareness of all the more visceral data accumulated by drones and collated by the intermediary bishops called gatherers. The blank masters are aware of the nature underlying this information, which is that some, such as the bugs, live by the letter, while others, the blanks, inhabit the spaces in between. Although we all exist, as I have said, only within this information. The primary split between the bugs and the blanks is merely semantic child's play. Whether we are of the information, or if it is of us. Once these two schools were one, and, it is written, will be so again. And, as it is written, so from one perspective, it already is. The fisherman deactivates the anti-gravity unit, and the body falls onto the slippery shale. He removes from his tote bag utensils, and commences consuming the carrion. I tell all this to you because we haven't got much time left. The general you pursue is coming to kill me to prevent me from revealing much of this information. The only luck that we have is that he does not even know of your existence, nor your case. He is pursuing his eliminations from the perspective of internal bedbug espionage. So the general is a gatherer, I interject. No, he is beyond their doctrines. He is of a practice even older than either the bedbugs or the blanks. To understand this, one must first understand that these two orders both see themselves as representative of the beginning of the universe. The bugs of the golden ratio based faces or bodies, and the blanks of the letters that can be seen in abstraction. However, these both take for granted the presence of a viewer, of an eye through which their perception founded existences came to occur. This is where the faction represented by the general comes into play. They are known as the Cheshires. I believe you are familiar with Cheshire Sam already. Is he not the man around whom your case revolves? Why exactly would the general care about the affairs of the bedbugs then? It is not the bedbugs alone whose internal affairs interest him. It is the blanks as well. As well as the blanks have any inside or outside. You see, to a Cheshire, the affairs of the bugs and the blanks are really little more than a game. One day a move is made on one side, 
another on the other. It is all very boring. It is difficult to say whether the Cheshires do this for fun or if it happens through genuine hostility. It is only known that they are concealed behind a veil of inference that is as luminous and simultaneously ebon as the first moments following the creation. To know more than this, one has to penetrate this veil. This, and I tell you now so that you know what you must do, is like a blind man learning to see, or a deaf man to hear. My own personal theory is that the Cheshire embody the physical state of existence for the Creator, if there truly is one, and that the bugs and the blanks are merely varying degrees of health. I refuse to even determine that one group is sick, the other well, in the traditional sense of these words. Merely that one technique may cause healing in one and illness in another, and that we are all part of the universe. Bill's eyes flutter skywards, considering the contrast between classical visions of heaven and the bleak wasteland that surrounds us now. Tonight I'm going to pinch a tent closer to the ship. You pitch yours some way further up the hill behind some cover. Remain out of sight. When the time comes, you'll know. He gives me a tent and a roll-out sleeping bag from his tote and parts company with me about a third of the way up the hill. It only occurs to me, some time after he has left, to be concerned about where the boy's head ended up. From my position I can see the entire circle of warm yellow light cast from the fire he creates near the ship by heating the shale with the taser. I leave the flap open and curl up in the sleeping bag, pulling my fedora down mostly over my eyes. There is the howl of the wind for a ghastly long time. Waves of sand washing over the tent in searing peels, the flap tugging at itself. This gradually fades away until there is such a profoundly deep silence that I think I am sleeping. It is only when I realize the sound of distant conversation is not a dream that I realize I am not. Well, the soul's just a microcosm of the spirit, says one voice. Dwelling in the brain as the spirit, the body, says the other. I put my head out of the tent flap slowly, as though there were a venomous serpent coiled directly outside. Looking down, I see by the dwindling flicker of the camp's central flames the strangely warping forms of two upright men, twisting and shadow dancing like pillars of smoke. I cannot tell which is Piscot or Bill. Their conversation has turned itself around in another direction now, and I strain my ears to hear the words that seem to be almost swallowed up by the deafening silence. Understanding and imagining are the same, says the silence. thing man sit behind construct of flat wooden surfaces. He is many colors and no colors, uses five pink tendrils on a black stick to fill white areas with non-white scratches, trying to put his brain as he imagines it onto paper as he understands it. This voice is craggy, reminiscent of Williams. Is it, though? To be understood, not to be imagined. Descartes' take on Hamlet. How do I even know thing man is man? I cannot see his pink trunk. Man body, I assume, beneath the clothes. Is this really all it takes to make a man? I could make a man, and I have. In my mind, thing man sits before me, in my brain as I imagine it, takes shape outside my eyes in non-white scratches on white areas. Thing man becomes an idea in the mind of any other reader, 
and is once immediately converted to memory as good as an admittedly dull experience. My friend yesterday said of TV watching being us done at the just then time, I am only waiting for the bright rain thing to come and make the power go away. Shortly, several lightning strikes nearby left us in a temporary blackout. The rain outside the window, the bawling joke man on the TV, thing man inside my brain as I imagine it. The two voices seem to mesh, blending together omnipresently. Glass barriers between one side of in and the other, only a dream of balance and predictable orientation is our continued expectation of such convenience. Man confuses man's senses. It is difficult to tell who says this. All else can be trusted. It is impossible to tell who says this. But man's shadows don't always move from external forces, I imagine, even as they are understood to be a thing man by my shadow. There is a pause in their talk. It unnerves me greatly. I can feel the building up of quivering throughout my entire body, as though I would be thrown into a seizure simply by the incompletion, the lack of closure, the dreaded, hanging, impending question. The general speaks next. His voice is deeper now than Williams's. It seems he is the shadow on the left. I don't like to write much. The things which inspire me to write also inspire me to write in a very specific style. This would be all to benefit if they were only dead objects which speak to me with such voices. But no, they have to be books. Rather than being a polite, inanimate object, a book must feign being alive in the most arrogant way. It acts as if it is you who are the empty husk, and not it. In this way, a good uppity book, like an overbearing pet, steals your consciousness from you. Flat-footed demand from this collection of skin grafts bound from the author's swollen carcass. Perhaps it is this stealing of livingness that is literature's entire appeal, regardless of how effective. Consciousness is transported from body to book, actual sensations deadened as they are imputed into the hypothetical situation. The body then is a dead object, and the soul is transported into a coffin full of paper bones, dried marrow thoughts, stiff jointed ideas and decomposing images. Every author writes about this death, even if it is only in the delicate ignorance of it that their words bear, the frustration of an implied emptiness will still be present. They write about the death of the reader, their own future death as experience is relived in the form of artificial memory. Every author is simultaneously a reader. Every author writes about his own death. Wilhelms rejoins, although he is already wilting. The soul is looking down, the spirit looking up, yet they are both merely a single fiber in the fabric of the space-time continuum. For a writer to write, he must first learn how to let others read. Only when anyone can read anything can they then become the writer's words, and only once they are the writer's words can their... General Tso extends his arm toward the kneeling knight. There is an explosion, a sound that seems to echo off the air itself, cascading outward, doubling itself, quadrupling itself, until it sounds as though the entire world has been shot. The general dances about joyfully, appearing to spiral around the circle of light like a twister of pure shadow, waving his gun in the air. I gave him the gun, he sings loudly to the air, I shot him. Then he stops, sensing something not quite right. He turns slowly around towards my direction. There seems to be a long pause. 
Finally, he raises his gun and shoots it at the Hermes, penetrating the thruster and bursting the protean engine. The yacht erupts into an immense spherical inferno, temporarily blinding me and warming my skin. When my vision returns to me, the wreckage of the ship is still alight, its skeletal shell sprawled out like a billion burning stars in the blackness of the night. But the general, he's gone.